Oh, that's right. We are here. It is Tuesday afternoon, and we have Ben Sheely with us. He is running for solicitor for the Eighth Circuit, which, of course, is our circuit right here. He was here with us back in May, June, before the primary, and how's it been going, Ben? Well, you know, I kind of sat back a little bit while the primary was going on to see who would come out of that. And since the primary, I, I cranked it up, I think probably in July, end of July, I cranked it up. So doing a lot of meetings, going to a lot of events, uh, putting out signs, trying to get out there and knock on doors. Uh, so it's been, been a great experience uh, thus far, and I think it's going well. Absolutely. Now, uh, well, it better be because uh, it's coming up here. November 6th is not very far away. It's not, and I think my wife is looking forward to that day. Uh, I think a lot of us actually are looking forward to that day. It's been a long process, hasn't it? It has. It, it has. has. So, um, now, Van, I just want to ask you, because um, originally you started out as a Republican and you changed to a Democrat. I did. I, I initially announced, I think it was August of last year, as a Republican. Uh, this is my first foray into politics, and, and I said, well, gosh, let me announce as a Republican, and, and solicitors are Republican, and that's who I'm going to face, and if we can face it off in the primary, uh, then we can go there. As I went along, I said, well, you know, let me, let me investigate this more. I, you know, I had a lot of Republican support out of several of the counties. Uh, then I began to get some uh, entreaties from a lot of your Democrats and, and asking if I wanted to run as a Democrat. And I said, well, you know, let me consider that. I, I have some Republican support. I've got Democrat support. Uh, I've never done this before. So let me go out and talk to people. And I talked to my supporters, both Republican and Democrat, and said, well, you know, what do you guys think? What kind of input? And across the board, all of them said, well, you know, it's really a nonpartisan office, Ben. It doesn't matter if you're running Republican or Democrat. We're going to support you. Either way, uh, you know, I can't make policy, you know, I can't raise your taxes, I can't do anything like that. So for me to run uh, as a Democrat, I had a great deal of support, uh, from, let's say, from people asking me that. And the Greenwood County Democratic Party has been wonderful to me. The Newberry Democratic Party, uh, Abbeville and, and Lawrence, have all been so wonderful to me. They, they welcomed me in with open arms and, and have helped me to kind of learn the ropes because, you know, as a novice in this. There's a lot of politics thing. involved in this, though, well, there isn't there? Is. There is a lot of <laughs> politics involved in this all the way around. Yes, there is. But uh, the people have been very, very helpful to me. You know, I think of Normal Davis and Elaine Gentry here in mm -hmm. Greenwood, uh, Jan Owens from over in Promised Land uh, and her group. They've been uh, so wonderful to me. Well, well, as a Democrat, you, usually Democrats are considered more liberal. Would that mean the solicitor's office would be more liberal? Well, you know, I, I think <laughs> you got to look at a Southern Democrat versus a, you know a, a Democrat from anywhere else. And I think the Southern Democrat is traditionally a conservative uh, Democrat, and they don't necessarily uh, follow the same tune as the National Party that is laying down. And so I, I don't know that uh, no, it's not going to be that much liberal because I consider myself conservative you know, and I've heard you know, Floyd Nicholson speak, I've heard Bob Merritt speak um, and I'm in line with, certainly with, with their policies okay. and I think both of them have been you know, Democrats for a long time. Floyd uh, had not been the mayor of Greenwood. Sure. You take Bob Merritt uh, having worked with Senator Drummond uh, for, 18 for I think, years. 18 years yeah. yep. Yeah. Well, he said he's actually, we had Bob on the show the other day, he said he has enjoyed being an independent. Well, you know, it, uh, I think being an independent absolves you of a lot of the politics, so to speak, because you can say, a lot well, of the you stink. Know, <laughs> and you say, I'm not Republican or I'm not Democrat, I'm independent, so yeah. you don't, don't come hammer me with your, your policies about you know, what you think's right, because I'm independent. Yeah. And so, you know. I well, we have gotten, we have gotten, you know, and I, I think this is true, we have gotten very partisan in our politics, and I think that's a shame, because we're not accomplishing stuff on the left or the right, because everybody is hunkered down with their position. I, I think you're exactly right, and I, unfortunately, I think that's occurred probably over the last, uh, you know, 20 years. Um, I don't remember it being quite uh, this vehement when I was younger, uh, and it seems like nowadays that it's either, well, you're a Democrat, I'm not going to vote for you simply because you're a Democrat, or you're a Republican, I'm not going to vote for you simply because you're a Republican. Um, I think you really, uh, 
to be an informed decision maker, you got to look at the individuals uh, who were on that ticket and look at their experience and make an informed decision. That being said, you know, I think we have a great slate of Democratic candidates uh, here in not only uh, Greenwood County, but throughout the circuit uh, running for a different office. Sure. Now, if um, if you had to describe yourself, I mean, what it, I guess I should say, when you become solicitor, how do you feel that you would run your office. This is just an opening discussion. What what would you feel would be the important factors in the office? I think the most important factor is probably to get back to the people. And, and by saying that, I mean we have to be open to our victims, to treat them with dignity and respect. I think a lot of the victims uh, feel like they were not treated with dignity and respect, feel like their cases were handled without uh, them knowing what was going on. What, what would you do different than over what's been done? I mean, we have, I do believe, victim advocacy and, and this type of thing. What would you do that would make it different from this last uh, solicitor? Well, I think the biggest thing, and I think Solicitor Peace pointed out in his, while he was running the primary, that almost every assistant solicitor has about 600 cases. Right. Well, if I counted right, I think there's 17 attorneys in that office there's only three victims advocates. Now, you do the math, uh, you take 600 cases and multiply it by 17, and then you take two people uh, that work in general sessions court and one that works down in, in juvenile court and figure out how many cases they have to handle. One of the things I would do is in, increase the number of victim advocates. I think we have to have a victim advocate for every county so they can be more hands-on and then they can be in touch with people and people know where they are at all times instead of you know, having a victim advocate that covers two counties where if I'm a victim in Lawrence, the victim advocate, excuse me, advocate may be over in Newberry and, and I might not be able to get in touch with him. Uh, same thing with Green, Greenwood and Abbeville. Uh, so I think you need an individual person that, that you can go to. So I think that's one change that I would do to make the victims uh, maybe feel more respected, uh, give them more attention. Oh, I know one of the cases that was talked about, and I don't know the particulars of the case and everything, but that uh, somebody was sentenced, received uh, probation, whatever they received, and the victim was not advised of that before it came down, and they were very upset about that. And, and yes, I know that we had, uh, I think, Citizens for a Better Greenwood had a stump meeting, and I think I know that at least yeah, one yeah. woman uh, stood up there and said, listen, I never had a clue that my case was resolved. When I started my race, I talked to all the heads of the law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, almost to a head, they said, listen, Ben, one of the biggest problems we've got is our victims aren't being notified. And quite frankly, a lot of times we're not being notified of when our cases are being disposed of. So the victims are coming to us, and we're saying, well, let me check on it. And then we go check, and we find out it's been either dismissed or it's been uh, pled out. And, and we were never informed, and the victim was never informed, and, and they're not happy. Um, and we got to make those folks happy. I, I often tell the groups I talk to, the two groups that we need to make happy the most are the law enforcement and the victims. And if we please those two groups, those are the people that have the involvement uh, in the criminal justice system in the Eighth Circuit. Now, having said that, we also need to look at our defendants and try to figure out what got you here. Uh, is there some way we can make our system better that we don't see you again? Because Does that mean putting them away forever so you don't see them again? Well, there's some, there's some I call them problem children. Right. Those are repeat offenders. And then you have your violent offenders. Those folks cannot conform themselves to the morals of our community. And we got to throw them away, you know, and, and throw the key away. But our other folks that are in here maybe for the first time, they may be in there for the uh, second time. we got to look at them and, and figure out what brought them here. One of the biggest uh, examples I use, or best examples I use, is a case I had where a young man, I will call him a, a really a serial burglar, and he kept on committing burglars. I kept on seeing him, and, and finally, you know, we sent him down the road for a, a good while. And about a month after we sent him down the road, one of his good friends came in, not related to a crime or anything, just happened to be in the courthouse. And I didn't know he was a friend of the guy until he said something, said the guy's name, and so I went over and I said, well, let me talk to you about him. I said, he came up here a lot. Uh, what's his deal? What's his problem? Because he would never talk to me. Mm -hmm. The defendant would never talk to me. 
Uh, and the guy looked at him, Mr. Sheelan, uh, his mother and father are dead. And he doesn't know how to eat. You know, he was not uh, really old enough to I guess, catch on to the DSS system or the social services that could be provided for him. So he broke into people's homes so he could eat. And, you know, I look at that guy and I say, well, here's a person that if we had known that, we could have made a better you know, decision. You know, we could have redirected this individual. We wouldn't have the victims. People would not have lost property that, that they hold dear. And this young man uh, would not have been incarcerated for a number of years. And those are the kind of people we got to catch uh, before they get incarcerated for a number of years. And that helps our community all the way around. And they become part of the system for a long time, and we end up paying the price because they are in the system right. for a long time. You know, it increases our, you know, our taxes because we've got to keep them in the system, uh, whereas if they can become productive members of our community, they're paying taxes. And I don't have to see their uh, smiling or frowning face in the courtroom again. Absolutely. And, and we don't have nearly the number of victims that we had. So you, know, that's, you, you have to approach it in a holistic you know, sense where we're looking at you know, every part of the system and, and trying to figure out. Well, one of my questions would be, though, Ben, how do you do that when you have so many cases? I mean, you talk about attorneys having 600 cases mm -hmm. a year. I mean, how do you how do you look at this based on those the number of cases that are out there? Well, I think that's where you have to sit down with law enforcement and say, guys, tell us where your problem children are. Let's get those folks taken care of. Let's get them out of our system. Let's get them down into Columbia or wherever you know, they're incarcerated. Uh, and when we get those uh, folks out of the system for a number of years, uh, you'd be surprised at the number of crimes those just uh, one individual may commit. Uh, I talked to Chief Brooks months and months ago, uh, and one concern he had was they'd arrested a the guy in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and I think 2011, and these were fairly serious crimes. Well, you know, if we take him off the street in 2006, you know, you don't have seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven to worry about. Sure. So those are crimes. That, you know, we get that those folks that commit a large number of crimes, and we send them down to Columbia. Well, then we can concentrate better on the folks that we can either work with and get them out of our system totally, uh, because there you know, there are ways we can handle them better, or uh, we just you know, we have to. I don't want to say beat down everybody because we, we can't do that. Right. Law enforcement knows we can't do that, and I've talked to a number of law enforcement officers. But but once we get rid of that, you know, twenty percent of the criminals that's, that's committing fifty percent of the crime, sure. Guess what? Our docket shrinks, and we just progress from there. Yes. And, and we keep keep getting rid of the problem children because some of those ones that we think we can help, we're not going to be able to help, and then become problem children. We say, fine, you know, you've demonstrated to us that you cannot be a part of our community the way we want to live because uh, really everybody wants to just be safe. They want to be, able, they want to be able to eat, they want to be able to provide for their family, they want to feel safe on the streets and that's what I want for our community. I want our community to feel safe. Absolutely. We are here. We're here with Ben Sheely. He is running for solicitor of the Eighth Circuit. Hey, I'm Ann Eller. If you've got a question or a comment for Ben, just give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. Don't you? All right. All right. We're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. And again, if you have a question for Ben Sheely, he is running for solicitor for the Eighth District or Eighth Circuit, which is... Greenwood, Abbeville, Newberry, and Lawrence, is that right? That's Lawrence. correct. Okay. And, of course, you are an attorney. You have a private practice in Newberry, correct? I do. I do. Uh, my partner and I, Mindy Zimmerman, uh, started our practice about four years ago when both of us left the uh, solicitor's office. You actually worked in Jerry Peace's the solic for solicitor, right? I sure did. I worked... Uh, I worked under Towns Jones years ago, uh, and actually Jerry was a deputy solicitor, and I worked under him as a, as a deputy solicitor, and then you know, Jerry became a solicitor, and I, I worked for Jerry. I also worked in the upper part of the state with uh, Bob Ariel when he was a solicitor in the 13th Circuit. But Mindy was a drug prosecutor, and that's uh, what she did for, I think, her entire uh, time with the uh, solicitor's office. And we decided to go out on our own and, and uh, set up shop in Newberry. Both of us were very uh, comfortable with Newberry. And, we have been really extremely blessed in Newberry. We've had uh, a little over four years now that we've been there, and, and we've done very well. Uh, and 
it's it's a really a wonderful experience. So I might ask you, why did you decide to run for solicitor? I mean, if I remember correctly, you have four young children. I do. Um, why did you decide to run for solicitor? I mean, this is going to be a you know an all-in job now. It is. It is. But since the time I wanted to be a lawyer, I wanted to be a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And it's a you know it's a deep yearning uh, within I don't say within my being. I mean, I know that sounds kind of trite. But that's really what I always wanted to do as an attorney. I spent most of my practice, 11 out of the 17 years, and I'm getting ready to go on my 18th year, in the Eighth Circuit. And I have a love for the Eighth Circuit uh, that is, I don't want to say it's unbounded, mm -hmm. but Newberry has been very good to me uh, professionally, as well as you know, a home place where you know, my parents lived for 23 years before they. Uh, moved. Uh, I live uh, in their house now. And did you move your family down? What did y'all do? I, I have my, my, I am down there right. uh, to be in the circuit. We didn't want to move the children twice mm -hmm. um, because, you know, in your wife the is horrible, a pastor, horrible, right? she is, she's yeah. a Lutheran minister, in the horrible event that I would lose the race. That um, you don't believe. That's right. I, I think I will win this race. But if we do, if I do in fact lose, we'll probably move the children into the prosperity area of Newberry County. If we uh, win the election and successful, we'll probably move into the 96 area of Greenwood County. And we didn't feel that it was beneficial to the children to have them move twice. Uh, it's such a uh, I guess formative time of their life. How old are your kids? I have one that's eight, one that's six, one that's three, and one that's ten months. Last time you were here, he was six months. <laughs> so time is moving. It is, and you know he's he's on the edge of walking now, and uh, it, it's a very exciting time around our house because the, the other three children uh, just love watching him, uh, love playing with him. And yesterday they spent time at at the state fair and at the Columbia Zoo because uh, they were actually out of school, so they got to do some amazing things, and apparently they got to ride the elephants. Which I didn't realize you could do, but apparently it's. So a, are you jealous? Uh, no, I'm not. I don't know that I've ever wanted to ride an elephant. Uh, and you know, I teased my my oldest son because you know he got up to the elephant and apparently told his mom that, you know, this is not for me, mom. I'm not riding that elephant. And, and I look at it and I probably would have said the same thing. You know, that's a big animal. I don't know if I'm gonna hit on that. But he ran the rode the camel instead. So. Well, there you but, go. But his sisters were very excited. They got to ride the uh, ride the elephant. And, uh, they had a wonderful day, but. But you got into but, to it because you... Yeah, I mean, I just love it. I love the community, and I, I, I love prosecuting every aspect of it. You know, it, it, that's where I feel, and I hate to use this term, but I feel a calling uh, to be a prosecutor. Uh, and I hate to use that term because I've always associated a calling with the ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, I have 11 generations of Lutheran pastors uh, in my family. I have an uncle who's a Lutheran pastor, a cousin, my wife's a Lutheran minister. So I associate that term with, with the ministry, uh, a calling into the ministry. And uh, I was reminded last week that, you know, you have callings for a variety of, of different uh, areas. And, and I certainly don't think I have the demeanor as a, of a minister. Uh, and I really, really you know, love being an attorney. I love, you know, the criminal court. I love the prosecution side of the criminal court, and, and I love the And how is it working on the other side here, as you're defending criminals here uh, in private practice, or is that what you're doing in private practice? Well, our, our private practice, you know, being criminal uh, lawyers, that's, a, that's an extension. We do mostly appointed cases, because typically you don't have a whole lot of people that, that can afford really private defense attorneys anymore. Sure. Uh, so we do a lot of appointed cases. We have appointed cases here, here in Greenwood, in Abbeville, in Lawrence, uh, in uh, everywhere, you know, everywhere in the circuit. You sure. And you know, we have appointed cases you know, outside the circuit. Uh, but as an attorney, we're called to zealously represent our client. And we do that. You know, Mindy and I and, and the other attorneys in the office, uh, we take that seriously. Our, our ethical obligations to represent our uh, clients to the best of our ability, and if we didn't do that, we wouldn't. Uh, well, number one, we wouldn't be fair to the system. Sure. We wouldn't be fair to uh, the community. We wouldn't be fair to our client, and we wouldn't be fair to ourselves. So, uh, 
we take that very seriously. Absolutely. And you know, I think when we work on our cases, most of the time we can resolve our cases. I don't want to say without going to trial because if we have to go to trial, we're more than, than happy to go to trial. But we normally can sit down with the uh, assistant solicitors and law enforcement and say, you know, here's the case, here are the problems we see with the case. Uh, what do y'all think? And, do you think you should do that? Do you think you should do that? Um, I understand your opponent believes that we should slam the book when we uh, when we have a case. Do you, should we work out a plea deal? Well, if we don't work out plea deals, let me tell you what that that, that system is going to implode upon itself. Yeah. When I first became a solicitor years ago, I said, "Well, gosh, we just if we've got a great case, we've just got to slam the door shut." Mm -hmm. on these people. We've got to send them down the road. I guess that and was early on in your career. That was. And uh, old uh, circuit court judge uh, Rodney Peoples, who's now retired, he said, you always, as the state, you negotiate from a position of strength. Right. And he recognized that you may have a slam dunk case, which never exists. And I'm going to tell you that as a prosecutor, it just doesn't happen. You may have one of the best cases you think you have ever seen in your life. And if that's the case, then you negotiate from a position of strength. And you get the best sentence that you can uh, for the state. Because that's, you know, as a prosecutor, you're zealously representing the state and the community. And so, yes, Does that mean you have to go to court? No. no. I mean, you have to go to court and put the plea on the record. Right. But uh, when you have a very strong case, the criminal defendant knows it. The defense attorney knows it. And it's doesn't serve any purpose for them to say, okay, you know, my sentence, the, the maximum I could possibly get is 15 years, uh, but you're offering me 12. So I'm not going to take that. I'm going to roll the dice and see what I can get. And, you know, they go to court and your case is as good as you think it is, and they get 15 years. You know, and I think you have to give a defendant sometimes the credit for coming forward and saying, hey, yes, I did this. Uh, this is a crime that I will admit to, um, and you have to give them a little bit of credit for that for admitting it. I mean, the federal system certainly does. They, sure. they used to have sentencing guidelines, and, and one of the things when you get a downward deviation is when you admit your crime and you come in and plead, they'll give you a downward deviation. And when they do that, it saves uh, you tax dollars, it saves sure. court time, sure. it allows you to move uh, cases like you, you need to move. Um, what, what about it, though, as far as the uh, law enforcement saying we want this one to, you know, go to trial? What, you know, that sometimes I know law enforcement here in our area feels that they're not getting a, enough of a slam to put that can't put that person away or whatever. Well, I think that's why we have to work hand in hand with law enforcement. We stand with them, and, and I know in all our counties we try to go. At least when I was prosecuting, we try to go. To the uh, law enforcement say. What are you guys looking for on this individual person? And oftentimes, law enforcement becomes frustrated because they've seen this guy all the time committing the crimes, and they're like, sure. you, know, you know, Ben, we know this guy's committing crimes. We know, and I know, and I know. And I said, you know, I understand that you know, and you know, and you know, but this is the first time you've got him into court. I can't give him 20 years because you know. he's done that. <laughs> Uh, you think he's done before, and we've never been able to catch him. Uh, I can come in. I, I mean, I can put him in front of a judge straight up, and the judge is not going to give anybody 20 years on a, on a first-time offense unless it's a, a very heinous offense. Sure. Uh, you know, and then yeah, you know, then you're going to get the, the book thrown at you. And I think we have certain uh, offenses that require uh, you get the book thrown at you. But working with law enforcement and standing hand in hand uh, with them, I think you can come to an understanding. And, and they can come to an understanding where you are, and you can come to an understanding where they are, and you can get appropriate sentences uh, for these folks. Do you think there's been um, a lack of communication between law enforcement and the solicitor's office here? I think there has been, in certain counties, a lack of communication uh, with law enforcement. And I don't know what that reason is. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes law enforcement doesn't think you're giving them a fair shake as far as maybe who they get as attorneys. Mm -hmm. You know, I know one complaint uh, years ago when I went to Abbeville uh, as the deputy solicitor was, listen, they send us brand new solicitors all the time. 
And because we get brand new solicitors, you know, we're not getting good sentences and we're not getting well, you don't trials. get any working relationship there. Right. Yeah. And luckily, you know, I was lucky enough to come over there. You know, I'd had many, many years as a uh, solicitor, and we had uh, a young man come into our office, Austin McDaniel, uh, who came over to that office. Austin being new, wanted the challenge, and Austin was up to the challenge and did an excellent job, had an excellent relationship. Uh, with law enforcement over in Abbeville County, and we also had other prosecutors at the same time that were in the season prosecutors. And we, uh, Austin and I, we were over there solely all the time. And right. the other prosecutors switched counties between Abbeville and Greenwood. And by the time Austin and I left, I think we had a wonderful working relationship uh, with the sheriff's office and Abbeville City Police Department. And, and we kind of understood each other, and you know we may not have agreed every time mm -hmm. that the sentence went up, uh, but we certainly uh, understood each other, and we understood where everybody was coming from, and uh, and it, I think it worked very well at the time. And I think as long as you have that relationship and uh, you can work with them, you're okay. And I think sometimes that was lacking, but uh, there are times where I, I don't know that you can prevent some of those things. Absolutely. Well, we are here with Ben Sheely. We've had a couple of questions come in. Hey, do you have a question? One of the questions uh, about victims' advocate. Another one, um, as a theft victim, how they felt about everything. So when we come back, we're going to talk about some of these, and we're going to talk about some of the differences between Ben Sheely and his opponent. So I certainly hope you'll stay right here. Hey, you got a question for Ben? Give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. Pick up that phone. He wants your question. We'll be right back. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. That's right. We're right back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. Gosh, we got questions coming in. Time is running short, 441 in the afternoon. If you have a question for Ben, don't hesitate to give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. Let's, uh, let's go through some of the questions that we've had. They're, uh, they, are, they are very good. Um, well, one of our call-ins earlier in the show when we were talking about you wanted to add more victims uh, advocates, said that uh, Betty said that uh, the victim's advocate was very sensitive but also came across as very harried and with the number of cases well exactly I mean that's and that's why I say we have to add uh, more of those um, because they are very harried when they're dealing with that number of cases and you know in certain offices you may during a court term have five attorneys coming to you saying can you please contact this victim can you please contact that victim and all of a sudden you know He's, he or she is working on a place and all of a sudden they're asked to contact five different victims and they're trying to do that and they're trying to coordinate schedules to make sure that the victim uh, can get time off to be in court uh, for the plea to set up right. And so they are very hairy. You know, I know that our uh, victims advocates that are in the office now, right now, uh, Ken Wiltshire, uh, who handles Newberry and, and Lawrence, and, and we had Angie Castillo, uh, who was in the office and she handled uh, Greenwood and Abbeville. Now, uh, Angie has uh, since left the office uh, just because you know family you know, moving in a different direction. I think uh, that's, a loss. Have, that's a uh, loss for the solicitor's office. I know Angie. Angie's wonderful. Was wonderful with the solicitor. And then we have uh, Julie Bledsoe down in the uh, juvenile area. And they are all very caring uh, people. You know, and they try their best uh, to serve everybody. And, and I know that. I, I can speak for Ken personally. Uh, when Angie, when I was in the office, Angie was uh, not a victim's advocate. She moved in that position after I left. But I don't think I've ever seen anybody in my life get more frustrated uh, when a plea goes up and the victim is not there than Ken. It, it just, uh, I think, it, it upsets him greatly when that happens, and he puts in, you know, 100%. Like I say, he is here. So I understand 
uh, what Betty's saying when she says, yeah, I'm dealing with a guy and he's doing a good job, but he's awfully harried or, or she is awfully Well, you know, and the other problem is you know, that uh, victim's advocate makes that telephone call, doesn't get him that time, has to move on to the next case, and then tries to get back to it, and right. it's hard to connect. So you right. need somebody that has that flexibility and that time mm -hmm. to make those telephone calls. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you have to, that's another job where you have to have a, a real people person that, that can talk to people and, and enjoys doing that. And, and talk to all types of people. Exactly. So yeah, that's exactly. the other thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, there you go, Betty. Uh, he agrees with you on that one. Brian Clark says that he was a theft victim. The Peace, meaning Jerry Peace's office, was very helpful, professional, and best of all, was considerate of his time. So uh, he appreciated what they did in the office for him. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's very important to be considerate of people's time. You know, I have seen cases where we're going to put this up for a plea, and then it doesn't happen. And then we're going to put this up for a plea, and then it doesn't happen. And then we're going to put this up for a plea, and it doesn't happen. And finally, the fourth time it gets up there, and by that time the victim is so upset. Um, at this point, not at the defendant. Right. But they're upset with the solicitor's office because they've been up there four times. And sometimes, you know, it can it help. Be up sometimes it can't be helped because you know the judge may have be some have to be somewhere and he shuts down court, or you know you may just have a number of pleas that day and, and we're not able to get that one in. But we have to make an, a concentrated effort uh, and a concerted effort to make sure that victims are treated with dignity and respect, and everything we do for them, you know, we look at their time schedule, when they can be there, and we plan it out. Uh, far enough in advance that that everything works out, and you only have to come to court uh, maybe one time. I know a lot of victims. You know, we have bond reduction hearings, and a lot of victims like to be there, uh, be present for bond reduction hearings. Some don't care to be there; they just want to be there for a plea. Now, you know, if you have cases where you have numerous defendants, numerous bond reduction hearings, and the, you know, the, and the victim wants to be there for everything, well. They're going to spend uh, a lot yeah, of time. Unfortunately, they're going to spend a lot of time, and they're going to get to know the inside of a courtroom very well, simply just being up there. But, yeah, we got to work on that. I happen to have the, uh, the opportunity to go as a juror to court here very recently with uh, Judge Addy. And <clears throat> he said one of the things that he wished would happen is that more people would come to court and see what happens in court, you know. And, and I was thinking about that. And back in the day, people did spend the time going to court. It was a big thing to go to court and see the cases. And now I guess we're, we're jaded by TV and all the other elements out there. We really are. When I first started practicing, uh, first started with Frank Partridge, who's an attorney down in uh, Newberry. And Frank's father, uh, you know, he would tell me of the times his dad would go to the courtroom uh, because that was the entertainment. You know? and, and he and, and the group of men, the retired men that, that he spent you know, mornings with, you know, during court week, they were like, great, let's go over to the courthouse and let's watch these trials. Let's see what's going on. Exactly. You know, it's kind of, I guess, their reality TV of the day. And, and we, don't have, uh, we don't have many people that come into the courtroom just to view uh, nowadays, it mainly be uh, high school uh, kids that are there for a class uh, or some requirements sure. that they have to be there. I just thought that was very um, interesting yeah. how that was a very popular yeah. thing to do yeah. and now it has dropped off. Yeah. We also had another call from uh, Lakita Thompson. She says, please do not try to be too harshest or project that, to be the, oh, excuse me, to be the harshest or to project that. Show us solutions, not just uh, ide ide ideals. Could you involve Gleams and United Ministry in part of your packages? Well, I think you have to involve the entire community. That's what I was talking about. We have to they get these problem children, and maybe that's not the best term to use, but these, these repeat offenders and these serious offenders, we have to move them out of the way uh, and get them in the court, you know, excuse me, in the uh, penitentiaries so we can focus on those folks that need maybe our help uh, and we can divert them out of our system into a better way uh, so that I don't have to see them again and so we don't have to uh, lose a productive member of our uh, society. I'm open, you know, if I'm elected, I'm open to all ideas uh, to how we can serve our community better, how we can uh, help you know, our youngsters come through some of the problems they have uh, to a better life, to a productive uh, member of society, because it, it really only helps the whole community all the way around. 
Absolutely. You know, one of the things that uh, has been instigated here has been a drug court. Would drug court be something that you would want to continue? I think drug court is something we have to uh, expand. Uh, right now, the way it's set up, I don't think we're reaching all the people we can possibly reach. It's when a cost I, act. Uh, it's yeah. a cost problem, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think right now we have it kind of restricted to Greenwood County, and drug court to be effective uh, to meet those classes and, and for the individuals to get there on time, there are very, very harsh requirements. And when I say that, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say they're too tough, but you have an individual and, and say, you have to be here every night at 6 o'clock for class, and if you miss one class, well, you fail drug court and then we're going to send you to prison. If you only have drug court in Greenwood County, those folks in uh, Lawrence and Newberry County really can't make that requirement. So if we're going to have drug court and we're going to make it effective, we have to make sure that uh, it's expanded enough to reach those folks in, in Newberry and Lawrence County. Uh, we have to, I don't want to say make it cost effective, because it, I think it is cost effective if we're able to get those people out of the system uh, to solve some of their addiction problems. I saw it work up in uh, Greenville. Uh, Greenville had the program probably for about two years before I, mean, I left that solicitor's office. And it's amazing to watch the people when they graduate from drug court. Uh, it's almost a relief and an excitement that they've finally uh, broken this cycle. Uh, and, and that's really what we have to do. And if we can expand that and make it work properly, yeah, I'm all for drug court working properly. Now, what about the uh, check? the check program, the uh, bad check program. You know, I've had people tell me that they love that bad check program because you know, it, it gets them their money back quickly and they don't have to worry about it anymore. And I've heard people tell me that that bad check program is, is ridiculous. Uh, when I ask the people why they think it's ridiculous, they say, well, you know, if you have a, a $10 bad check and there's a fee of $135, you know, that's really not equitable to do. I mean, if maybe the, you know, if I had a ten dollar bad check and I had to pay you ten dollars as a fee, you know, it might be okay. Well, isn't the so state I, fee twenty five or thirty five dollars for a well, bad check? Well, those are uh, those are for banks. You know, that's what okay. the banks set. Now, you have a statutory fee, and I, I'm pretty sure the statutory fee is one hundred twenty five dollars on the check. Okay. So it almost says if you're going to write a bad check, make it you know for two hundred fifty or three hundred dollars to make it worthwhile, and, and that's. We have to look at that. We have to see if that can be streamlined and fixed. I also talked with uh, an attorney uh, recently who said, well, I see a problem in the fact that if the person doesn't come in and, and pick up the bad check and make it good, well, then you have an employee of the solicitor's office uh, doing the warrant, and then the solicitor's office is prosecuting the case. Uh, therefore, don't you have a conflict of interest when it's actually your office signing the warrant and your office prosecuting? I'd never really thought about that. You know, if, if you think about it a lot, you know that that possibly is a conflict of interest for the solicitor's office to, to be the ones that are issuing the, the warrants, or not issuing the warrants, but seeking the warrants, and then prosecuting the case. It, it's kind of like a, you know, a, you know, a defendant or a victim, excuse me, seeking the warrant, prosecuting his own case, and being the only witness. You know, kind of getting a conundrum there. That looks like a little bit of a problem. I yes, agree with you. What do you think, um, you, you know, part of, of course, what everybody is always interested in anymore, and part of the thing that we're missing a lot of is money to run an office. Uh, you know, I know that uh, with 600 cases per attorney, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. We would love to, of course, not have to have them work so hard and everything. But how do you feel that the budget is based on what you're working with? I think the budget is probably adequate for what we need to do uh, for the uh, jobs we have to do. I think we have to look at uh, the salaries and some of, I don't say perks, but right now uh, I think the solicitor's office has uh, six cars uh, that, uh, with the solicitor's office. Uh, every attorney in the office has a, a state-issued cell phone. Those are ways to, you know, to cut back to save money. We've got to look at the salaries, too, to see if those really fall in line uh, with everybody around the state. In the year, in the fiscal year 2008-2009, the total funding from all sources for the solicitor's office was about 
uh, 1.9 million. It was a little more than that. Uh, for fiscal year 2009-2010, uh, again, it was, uh, was 1.98 million. And then for 2010-2011, it, it was a little over uh, 2 million. So you look at those numbers, and those are big numbers uh, Absolutely. to a lot of people. And they say, you know, gosh, is that an effective use of my tax dollars? And I say to them, well, we have to look at that, and we have to see if we are, in fact, using your tax dollars wisely. And we have to make an effort to make sure that, that the tax dollars are used correctly and wisely and efficiently. Uh, and if we may need to make some cuts in the office, and I'm not saying cuts in personnel, but, you know, cuts in equipment such as cars, such as cell phones, uh, things like that, then we need lights. to address those problems. You know, <laughs> got to have lights in this room. We go to a to totally a glass office, and I don't know that that would work okay. uh, real well. Uh, there, there are lots of issues, and uh, everybody is looking at tightening belts and seeing where they can cut. But now, Ben, you know, um, you and your opponent, what would you say is the biggest differences? We're running, we're at 4.55 this evening. What would you say are some of the biggest differences be between you and your opponent as this election comes to a close? Well, I think the biggest difference, quite honestly, and it is experience. I've been an attorney 17 years, going on 18 years. And I, what about your opponent? My uh, opponent will be an attorney starting his, uh, I think, ninth year uh, uh, in November. Uh, in that time, he's worked in the Attorney General's office and also down the 11th Circuit for Donnie well, Myers. Attorney General's office, that should have been a big... Well, if you work, look at what he did in the Attorney General's office, one of them was in the opinion section. Uh, what does that he, mean? That means he wrote, opinion, uh, wrote opinions for the Attorney General and researched. Uh, another time he worked for the Internet uh, crimes, sexual crimes, and then the sexually violent predators. Now, these are crimes where the Internet crimes is, you're truly prosecuting, but they're cases which, you know, I don't want to say about as slam dunk as you can get, but you, you look at a... They're stacked on the state yeah, side. They're okay. stacked on the state side where, you know, you have an officer working from a location and, and he's normally got a webcam and, and he's got that person's face on the webcam and he can track down the conversation and, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, other things with that webcam. And so those are pretty uh, easy cases to win. The sexually violent predator cases, now those aren't even criminal cases. Those are civil cases where somebody has served their time in prison and, and they come out of uh, prison and... and court system or, or, or the prison system says, well, gosh, I don't know if this person's safe to go back on the street. And there's a special set of rules for sexually violent predator cases where really you only have to have one witness. And the evidentiary rules that apply in other uh, civil cases don't apply. Uh, there's hearsay that is allowed, evidence uh, that would normally not be allowed in gets allowed in. Uh, so you're saying really, that's what he dealt with? Uh, well, I, I think that's on his uh, resume if you look. And, and those cases, again, are cases that are you know, almost impossible to lose. So if you look at his history really as a prosecutor, you're looking at about 3.5 years out of, out of his um, eight almost, you know, starting his ninth year. And then he worked for Donnie Myers. And that's where he got his 3.5 years um, as prosecutor. You know, and I, I, look, I know he's uh, indicated he had 90% conviction rate. Um, those numbers are, are incredible to me. Uh, I don't know that you could get to 90% unless you... Uh, throw in the sexually violent predator cases he took, which are, again, civil cases. Uh, they're not criminal convictions. Uh, and they're slam dunk cases because those are weeded through a system and through a, a sexually violent predator board. So by the time you get to them, uh, they're the cream of the crop as far as trying to keep the people locked up after uh, they served all their sentences. You know, like I say, you know, I've, nine years as a prosecutor. I prosecuted in, in Every county uh, in this circuit, uh, Greenwood, very little. I think I prosecuted maybe one or two cases in Greenwood. And uh, up in the 13th circuit, which is Greenwood Pickens. So my prosecution experience is, is you know, far and above his prosecution experience. I know the circuit uh, much better. Out of my entire practice, I've spent 11 years uh, practicing in the circuit. You know, I know every county uh, very well. I know the judges uh, well. I know juries. And, and when I say I know juries, it's really, uh, people say, what do you mean you know juries? Well, you, you soon realize that a prosecutor, that certain juries in certain counties are not going to convict on certain cases. Uh, regardless of how strong your case is, they look at it and say, well, you know, I don't care if that person hadn't been doing that, he wouldn't have gotten, wouldn't have gotten in trouble. Well, a good example is oftentimes we have two counties that if you've been drinking, 
and you know you get beat up through no fault of your own well you say well you shouldn't have been out drinking so it doesn't matter how good your case is on that those jurors are, are nine times out of ten going to come back and say well the guy shouldn't have been drinking if he wasn't drinking he wouldn't have gotten in trouble and so you know he kind of got what he deserved which is you know, legally not how it lines up but that's what those juries think so I know those nuances of the juries that, that David does not know I mean he's really never practiced in the Eighth Circuit, except for a smattering of cases that he would come up here and handle for the uh, Attorney General. So overall, I mean, it just boils down to my experience with the, not only with the circuit, uh, but as a prosecutor. And I think that's what you're looking for uh, in a solicitor, not, uh, not I don't say, a, a brand new uh, prosecutor. Uh, you're also looking for a person who supervises people and, and is, can deal with people over the years. Uh, I've served in the United States Army where I Supervised anywhere from the smallest six people all the way up to over a hundred people. This I is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Go ahead, Dave. go ahead. You can continue. I just have to say that. Go ahead. And you know, I have the experience in, in dealing with people. Uh, right now, we like I say we have a small firm in, in Newberry that my partner and I run. So that's a very you know one-on-one -on -one relationship with all our employees. And so you have to have that experience in dealing uh, with employees at all levels and in all different. How would you approach the office coming into the office? I mean, we already have uh, lawyers on hand that are working there. How would you approach the office? Well, you know, we've lost four attorneys. Uh, I think the Solicitor Peace they told me. I thought it was more. I thought they'd actually lost more than that. Um, but they've lost four attorneys. Some of them say they're going anyway, uh, regardless of you know, who wins the election, because they, they don't want to serve under another uh, solicitor. Then you can but understand I, that. Yes, certainly, yes. certainly. You don't want to switch to a new system when you, you've understood the system and you're used to that system. But I think we have to give everybody a, an opportunity uh, to do their job. If, I, if I'm coming in there, we're going to say to the people, look, I'm going to give you in three to six months to show me that you can do your job, and if you can't do it, then I'm going to have to show you the door. Uh, if you can do it, well, then good, let's go. Let's, let's move ahead. In these tough economic times, I don't think you can just come in and dump people out on the street and say, great, it was nice for you to work for the solicitor's office in Greenwood County for all these years, but, you know, have a nice time trying to find a new job. I mean, that's that borders on cool. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm not a cool person, and, and I don't believe that we have to, to do that to people. Uh, I think that, you know, as a solicitor, you set the tone for the office, and as long as you come down and tell your employees this is the path that we are following, they're expected to fall in line. They may not agree with your the way you want to approach things, and if they don't agree, you know they're free to leave. Sure. Um, but that's the way it is. You need. I think you're considerate of everyone. You're considerate of your employees. Um, but in order to make sure that the community, that the circuit is served well, you have to make sure that they're doing their job, that they're getting paid for. Because it doesn't do you any, good ju any uh, justice to have uh, an employee up there that you're paying you know, $40,000, dollars 60000 a year and they're not doing their job. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, those people, you know, if, they, if they don't want to conform to, well, it's been a pleasure letting you serve the, the community, but, you know, hopefully you can better luck somewhere so, else. Absolutely. Uh, All right. Well, we have been talking with Ben Sheely here. I will give you one minute just to wrap it up. What would you like the people to know? We've kind of talked over, but I'll give you one minute. Wrap it up here, Ben. Well, the most thing, uh, the biggest thing that I'd like the people to know that is, you know, I am passionate to serve the Eighth Circuit. You know, I love prosecuting, and I certainly would love to have their vote on November 6th. I enjoy the Eighth Circuit, and part of this politic that I, that I wasn't real sure that I would like because I'm to, at some extent, uh, an introvert, but it's to meeting people, and it's been glorious to meet all the people within within the Eighth Circuit and individual, and hearing their needs and hearing their problems and, and trying to understand what they want fixed. Uh, I think you vote for me. You vote for experience. You vote for somebody who knows the uh, circuit, uh, not somebody that's really brand new to the circuit and has to figure all that out. Uh, and I would appreciate everyone's vote on November sixth. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ben Sheely. Now, you will be tomorrow night, tomorrow night at uh, a 
Uptown Greenwood at the Little Theater. Yes, ma'am. That's right. You're going to have a forum there. They're also having one tonight. Yes, coming up in about uh, 15 minutes, I do believe. It starts at 530. They will be talking to the state office people. And tomorrow night, it is uh, you and your opponent will be there on the stage. So I certainly hope everybody comes out, ask questions, be informed. You know my philosophy. I want everybody to know everything. So when you make that decision, you don't have to vote straight party. You can vote for the person. And I really think that's important. How about you, Ben? I, I think that's very important to, to get your knowledge and get to understanding and to get a grasp because, quite honestly, this is uh, not a popularity contest. If we're going to serve the community, we got to we got to see those people that know the job and know how to do it best. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming out today. This is WCRS, and I do want to say this: there is a forum uptown Greenwood this evening. I have not seen a lot of advertising about it. I think there should be more. So, if you are listening to this broadcast and you'd like to know more about our candidates, please head Uptown Greenwood to the Community Theater. Be part of that. Starts at 5.30. I think it goes to 6.30, maybe 7 o'clock. It'll be time well spent. Thanks so much for listening today. I am Ann Eller right here on WCRS, right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody.